Hello and welcome back to Seasonal Fly Fishing Trips Part 2. I'm Raj Kletke. In Part 1 we had planned a trip to a spring-fed limestone river and I invited you to follow along through the magic of the computer. We had gotten our midges and blue winged olives ready as those were the organisms we were expected to see hatching and a few organisms that we carry year-round. My fishing partner and I were ready to go this coming, this third weekend in April. But something happened. Yes, we got snow in early April and more again the weekend before our planned trip. In fact, in some areas of our state, Wisconsin, we got over 30 inches, a new record for this time of year. Even more was added yesterday, Wednesday, to the driftless area I was planning on fishing. So, sorry, but we're not going to be going this weekend. So get some yard work done this weekend and let's try again for next weekend. Before I go on, I better explain that this video will be mostly a lecture, which is not for everyone, but it will help explain why I preferred to cancel this weekend and what additional patterns we may need by next weekend and why. So stick with me if you're interested. Even today as I make this video, the temperatures are warming up and the snow is melting. So why not this weekend? Should a little snow and cold temperatures stop us? Am I just a fair weather f fisherman? Well, yes, I am basically a fair weather fisherman. I fished in snowy conditions in such cold weather that I couldn't feel my hands to tie flies on. But if I'm not already on a trip, I enjoy fishing much more in pleasant weather and enjoyment is the major reason I fish. I can always tie flies in a warm room or even go play pickleball at the local gym. But besides being a fair weather fisherman, the melting snow will cause high muddy water and falling water temperatures even on these spring rivers. Yes, fish will feed in high muddy water and we may catch some with changes in our technique, but it's not as enjoyable fishing for me. But the falling water temperature, at least for me, is actually one of the major factors, along with the fact that I can go next weekend, when the weather will hopefully be a little nicer, for putting off the trip until next weekend. <clears throat> So, let's spend a moment looking at the effects of water temperature on trout fishing. The literature is much better and far more accurate than my rules of thumb, but the details will vary a little by trout species also. But I use 55 to 65 degrees as being the ideal water temperature on most trout rivers and streams. The insects and trout are both active and there will usually be fishable hatches. Above 70 degrees, the oxygen time content gets low, the trout are stressed, and generally I don't go fishing. Below 55 can still be excellent fishing. Midges are always active, and some mayflies and caddis may become active even at 45, and certainly by 50 degrees. I'm not really sure there's a definite too low a temperature for successful fishing. Certainly in real cold water, the fish are very sluggish, or even just plain dormant, and are found in different water types than in warmer temperatures. But many people ice fish for trout on lakes, and I've caught many stream and river trout in waters around or slightly below 45 degrees. But this water temperature was stable at 45 degrees, and I think that stability makes a big difference. Rising water temperatures above 45 may actually activate the insects and fish, so may be beneficial until it gets too warm with falling oxygen content. But water temperatures rapidly dropping to 45 to 50 degrees or below seems to slow down the fishing dramatically for me. So, for many reasons, my fishing partner and I are postponing the trip until next weekend. Hope you can make it. Now, of course, we're into late April. We'll need our midges, blue-winged olives, and year-round flies, but what additional flies may be needed? Are additional hatches expected? Will the cold, snowy weather and briefly falling water temperatures delay the hatches? According to a hatch chart for the area we'll be fishing, we may see both Ephemerella subvaria and Paraleptophlebia adoptivia by mid-May. I usually use the common names. Hendrickson's is somewhat consistently used for the female of this species with red quills for the smaller males, but sometimes Hendrickson's refers to both male and female. 
Red quill and some of the other common names listed are frequently used for unrelated genera also, which is why the scientific names are more specific. But I'll be using the common names for these species in the video today, so let's just continue. I enjoy trying to learn some entomology so I can identify these two different but somewhat similar mayflies to genus, but you really don't need to identify them to fish them correctly if you're observant on the stream, which I will explain later. But if you're interested, I'll give you my simplified approach. If interested, pause this video briefly to read this slide. Where we'll be fishing next weekend, likely you'll only see three mature nymphs. Dark wing pads is my marker for a mature nymph. If out east, you may need to add Epioris to your list, but that is a clinger nymph with two tails, so is easily identified. It's not really that difficult to tell nymphs apart, or the duns and spinners either. I enjoy trying to identify them, so my fishing partner brings them to me when he catches any. Now that we know how to identify the possible additional mayflies for this time of year, let's figure out whether we'll really need these additional fly patterns. As I mentioned in part one of this series, hatch charts are quite good for the order of expected hatches, but are less good for when a specific hatch will start. Predicting the start of a specific hatch is definitely not an exact science, so I have no real idea whether we'll be seeing these organisms this coming weekend or not. Water temperature certainly plays a role, but what about how long the water has been at a given temperature? What about the hours of daylight? What about other environmental factors? Are there other observable events influenced by environment that may help us correlate with the likely start of the Hendrickson and Mahogany Dunn hatches? Some feel phrenology can help. What about the timing of spring birds returning? What about flowering plants? What about numerous other events that happen in the spring and seem to at least partially be affected by the environment? Is there a correlation with the start of major hatches of interest to the fly fishermen? Possibly, but I don't know. I'm just starting to try to make these observations. I'm just starting to learn about phenology. So far, I've noted trilliums in the streamside woods during a sulfur emergence, but I'm not even sure of that association. I'm going to have to learn more about wild plants and be more observant. Maybe you'd enjoy this homework assignment also. So, what Hendrickson and Mahogany Dunn patterns should we carry along just in case? The Mahogany Dunns may be slightly smaller, but both are often similar in size and coloration. Many of the fly patterns in size 16 and 14 will likely work for both, but there are some behavioral differences that may affect the patterns we choose to fish. If you're not familiar with my terminology here, by the way, please review my Fly Fishing Hatches series. While both nymphs are commonly found in riffles, the Hendricksons tend to emerge there also, while the mahogany dun nymphs tend to migrate to slow water near the shore and often emerge adjacent to the banks in very thin water. However, the pheasant tail nymph will likely work for both. So before the emergence, fish it through the riffles for the Hendricksons and swing it into slow bank water for the mahogany duns. Usually, this will be around noon as the water warms, but the timing and where you concentrate your fishing is based on when and where the emergence was the day before. <clears throat> the Hendricksons tend to have a more impressive emergence with greater numbers and often will be in the riffles or just below as the riffles flatten out. The Mahogany Dunn emergence will often be very sparse and near the banks. So, even without identifying the specific mayfly emerging, you already know how to fish a Hendrickson or any other emergence that's happening in a riffle. You'll fish it with a proper sized dun pattern, commonly starting with a high riding pattern that you can easily see and going to a lower riding pattern or an emerger if necessary. Likewise, even without identifying the specific mayfly, you know how to fish a few rising fish adjacent to the bank in slow, shallow water. You can try low riding duns, but you're likely to do better with early floating nymphs or 
late emergers or cripples as the slow flat water has a tougher meniscus for insects to break through and at least with some small insects there will be more cripples. So what if there's an emergence in slower water but you don't know which mayfly it is? Again, use the right size fly and you know how to fish that situation even without knowing the specific mayfly. Observe the rise forms. If the fish are leaving a bubble, i.e. taking something off the surface, start with a done. If no bubble, i.e. taking something in the surface film or subsurface, start with a low riding done or maybe even better an emerger or cripple. Like fishing all emergences, if, you, if your first choice doesn't work, check your fly size, tippet length, and diameter to make sure you're getting a good float and change fly patterns as needed. I often like fishing a soft hackle singly or as a dropper, especially during a sparse emergence with widely scattered rising fish. But then you already knew that too. And if you and you didn't need to know the specific mayfly genus to do this. Both the Hendricksons and the Mahogany Duns will have fishable spinner falls. Both are generally recognized, like all spinner falls, by quiet rise forms on quiet water and finding these spinners on the surface. Again, you don't need to identify the specific mayfly. The rusty spinner in the appropriate size will likely work for both fishing at dead drift, as with practically all spinner falls. So, next time, join me for part three as we either tie some of the patterns we've discussed today, or I'll give you a report of next weekend's fishing trip if we do get to go this time. I'm Raj Kletke, and I'll see you soon.